I'd like to ask you to take your Bible uh, this afternoon to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. And I thought a lot about our conference and, and how to end our time together. And you know, if you've been to conferences, and especially if you've participated in conferences, you have the ability at, at the end to kind of, well, you do two things. Number one, you pray that the other speakers don't preach on your topic. And that's a very stressful thing. And, uh, and then you also have the ability for the Lord to do work in your own heart as you begin to process things and the Spirit of God begins to, to, to work in your own life. And that really has been the case for me over these last two days. I'm not sure really what I expected. I knew we were going to have a good time together. And I knew this was a topic that is of great interest and of deep value to the body of Christ and to those who minister in that body, whether formally and vocationally or, or, or just as ministers of grace through the Word of God in the personal ministry that God has given us in the body of Christ. So I, I knew we were going to have a good time. I knew that we were going to be deeply informed and challenged. I don't think I expected the work of God in, in my own life that has happened because as I've been listening and really just examining in my own heart, there have been very deep and very powerful questions that have come to my own life that I'm not sure I was expecting and I'm not sure that I fully know how to answer. So for example, one question that has come to my life is this, so how many genuine friendships do I have in the community of people that we just heard Rosaria Butterfield talk about. I have been a pastor for most of my adult life. I have pastored in communities where there are people who have identified themselves and, and struggle in the ways that Rosaria presented to us. I have acquaintances in my life that would, would, would say that they are same-sex attracted or that they are part of the gay community. I have been nice to them, I hope. But where are the friendships in my life that she described with the pastor who opened up his home to her and over a process of two years didn't just talk the gospel to her but actually lived it out? I don't know if that question is unique to me, but it is definitely a question that has left me very uncomfortable and very disquieted and, and one that I'm not quite sure what to do with other than to bring it to the Lord and say the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to resolve this, but I'm going to put it before you and ask you to resolve it for me. Another thing that came to mind as I've been listening and processing and talking to our speakers and processing things that I've heard is, is what I want to talk about today, and that is that in, in every session and in almost every conversation, there has been this reality that, that, and one of the things I've appreciated about our speakers is their transparency. I mean, it has been unbelievably transparent and, and, and biblically faithful in their fidelity to truth, but, but as I have processed all of this, it has become very evident to me that for those who have ministered to us in these two days, there has been an ocean of pain in their life. And the grace that I'm receiving from them, the, the benefit that I have uh, received this week has come out of that pain. And so uh, as I began thinking about the message I was originally going to give at this session, God, God just began directing me to a passage that I've called to your attention, and I want to read it to you uh, th this afternoon. Isaiah 61 says this, beginning in verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And then notice this, to comfort all that mourn. 
to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So what I thought I would do as we come to the end of our conference together is to simply ask and, and, and try to look at what the scripture has to say about the navigating of pain and suffering that comes to the life of every believer. We have, we have heard of it in the life of our speakers, but if the truth be known, every single one of us sitting out here in, in this conference, and, and really I don't know of a Christian anywhere who has not experienced at some point in their life deep suffering and prolonged pain. And sometimes we don't quite know what to do with that. And I think it's important as we go to a text like Isaiah 61, and we'll be looking at a text in 1 Peter 5 in just a moment, that, that we navigate the pain that comes into our life well because there are, there are compelling reasons for this. Let, let me give you three of them, and then we'll pray together and, and look at our text. It is, it is a reality in our life. It is a present and repeated reality. Pain and suffering come into every life. And we'll, we'll talk about the contours of that here in just a moment, but think about the most perfect individual that ever lived on the planet, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and his life included prolonged suffering and deep personal pain. And so I think it's important that we learn to navigate the contours of pain carefully and biblically because it's a present and repeated reality in our life. It's also a very real and a very present danger in our lives. It can do great spiritual damage to us and to others. And the Bible is full of stories of people who in moments of pain and suffering did great spiritual damage to themselves and and even at times to other people. We all are familiar with the adage, hurting people often hurt other people, and there's a reason for that. And then maybe a third reason that we need to talk a little bit at the close of a conference like this on how to navigate the contours of pain in ways that are biblically faithful is simply this. Pain oftentimes presents a great spiritual opportunity for us and for the gospel. And and again, our Bible is filled with stories like this. And so how do we deal with pain and suffering in a way that honors God, that results in our own spiritual growth and benefit, and ultimately advances the gospel? In the two texts that we have looked at, one that we will look at here in a moment, I think help us to navigate the contours of pain and suffering in our life in ways that reflect honor to God and growth and benefit to us, and that advance the gospel. But before we get into that, let's pray, shall we, and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Father, as we come now to this final moment, as we look now to Your Word and to portions of Your Word that deal with this very real and very present part of our life that comes to every one of us, we we pray that You would give us grace to hear Your Word and insight to understand it, and the willingness to embrace it and obey it. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I would suggest that navigating the contours of pain and suffering in in lives like our own starts here. We, We have to come to terms with the reality of pain and suffering, that, that in fact it is a part of life and, and it is not going to change. That between now and the time we stand in the presence of the Lord, we are going to encounter repeated episodes of suffering and pain. And nothing will test the metal of our faith and of our endurance as, as we walk with God quite like pain and suffering. So what does the Scripture have to say that will help us come to terms 
with the reality of pain and suffering in our life. And, and I would suggest that, that as we think about this, that we recognize some things, that, that suffering tests us by pushing us to the limits of our endurance. I mean, how many times do you find yourself saying with Job, how long can I endure this? I mean, there have been times in my life, and I'm sure there have been times in your life where, where the pain and the suffering and the emotional weight that comes with all of that puts you in a place where in your conversation with God, you're asking those kinds of questions. Lord, how, how much longer can I endure this, and how much more of this can I take? So suffering tests us because it pushes us to the limits of our endurance. And sometimes we think it's going to push us even beyond our ability. Suffering disorients and confuses us because we don't always understand the reason or the cause or the source or the point to our suffering and our pain. And so we tend to ask God questions like this, why are you allowing this? What possible purpose are you trying to accomplish through this? Why are you not resolving and relieving this? So suffering disorients and confuses us because we don't always know the reason or comprehend the point to our suffering and pain. And then notice that when it is prolonged and painful, it can actually cause me to doubt fundamental realities about God. And this is really the history of many, many people who have labored through a journey with pain and suffering. For example, we, we question God's love and affection for us, and, and, and we start wondering, what in the world have I done that has so displeased God that, that He would bring this upon me? Why is He angry with me? Has He forgotten or abandoned me? This is really the testimony of the pilgrim we encounter in Psalm 119 when he sort of lifts up his voice to God and he begins to cry out, why have you abandoned me? I feel like a wineskin that you hung up in the rafters and when you put me up there, I was, I was uh, young and supple and now that, that wineskin is aged and is brittle. It has been there so long. We tend to ask ourselves questions about God's power and ability to care and provide for us. If He's truly loving, and I believe that He is, then He must not have the ability to deliver me from this, or He must not really be fully aware that this is happening in my life. And sometimes we question God's plan and purpose for all of this. How can this kind of pain and this kind of loss and this kind of suffering be God's good and acceptable plan for my life. And I'll just stop here for a moment and speak as a pastor. I spent most of my adult ministry pastoring people, and it's very easy to preach on suffering, and it's very easy to talk theologically about suffering, and it's very easy to go quickly to Romans 8, 28, and Romans 12, 1 and 2, but it's extraordinarily hard when all of a sudden you find yourself in the crucible of pain that is deep and prolonged, and God seems to be absent, and He certainly seems to be silent. And you know all the things to do because you've preached those things to others. You know to read your Bible. You know to pray. You know the disciplines uh, of grace and the means of grace. You don't abandon the body of Christ. You listen to preaching. You partake of the elements that are so graciously given as a way to remind us of the incredible sacrifice. You, you follow the disciplines that are laid out in the Scriptures for prayer and, and community. And over time, it seems like the desert just keeps going on and on and on, and even, even in the position of one who has studied theology and has preached to others, you really do start to wonder about fundamental realities that you have taught others about God. And in the midst of all of this, God acknowledges the reality of suffering in the lives of His children. 
Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter writing to people like us says, Beloved, and he's addressing them, and this is sort of a title. This is not, this is not Paul saying, or Peter rather, saying to them, Hey, I love you. There's somebody greater that he's reminding them of that feels this way about them. You are beloved people, and the person who loves you like this is God. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Some unique and alien thing is going on in your life, and and Peter is helping to remind us that that pain and suffering in our life is inevitable. It will come. And when it comes, it will be like this, a fiery trial. It is excruciatingly painful. God does not hide this from us. Peter goes on in verse 19 of the fourth chapter of his first letter and says, wherefore, let them that suffer, and there's an amazing little phrase here, according to the will of God, In other words, Peter is saying to people like us that there are going to be seasons in your life. There are going to be sections of the journey of faith for you that in the will of God are going to involve deep pain and prolonged suffering. And when you suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It is a necessary part of God's good plan for our life. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, we find something else. We find that our suffering will actually be limited in length and in severity. Notice what Peter says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. In 1 Corinthians 1013, in a very similar way, notes that the severity of our pain and suffering will be limited by an all-wise God who will not tempt you beyond your ability. And so I think as we talk about pain and suffering in the life of a believer and how to navigate the contours of that in a way that is biblically faithful, the first thing that has to happen is we have to come to terms with the reality of pain and suffering as a part of our life. And that brings us to the second question, and that is, well, why, why is it there, and, and how did it get there? And so I think the next thing that has to happen in our own understanding of a theology of pain and suffering is to, to comprehend, to understand its roots. What are the roots of pain and suffering in the life of a believer? And, and these are not complicated roots. These are are not new ideas, but, but let me just for the sake of putting them out there for us say that generally all suffering is rooted in sin. All pain is rooted in sin. I'm not suggesting that your personal sin is, is what, what is responsible for all of the pain in your life. I'm just suggesting that pain in the world and suffering in the world originated somewhere. There was a moment in the history of our race. There was a specific point in time that we can point back to and say that is where all suffering and all pain arose from. That is the origin. That is the root of it all. And there is a monumental thing that happened that had earth-shaking impact on the entire race. And that moment is identified for us and it is, it is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through verse 19, when God spoke not to our mother, Eve, but to our father, Adam. And he said to Adam, because you, the weight of all of this rests on Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife as opposed to my words, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And then notice the text, and I'm reading it out of the ESV for clarity. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days 
of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Interestingly enough, Adam and his sin, the cause of all human pain and suffering, will be delivered by a pain that God described what happened to Eve as she brought forth a son. And over time, through the lineage of Eve, would come a son who would suffer all the pain of the world and bear away the sins of the world and make it possible for us to go back to that garden that we started it. And so we could say the origin of pain, the root of suffering, generally is in sin, but specifically it comes from the depravity and the brokenness of living as fallen people in a cursed world. Heath Lambert, and many, many of you know uh, his works and his writings, has six very helpful categories, at least to me, that, that help me sort of navigate the framework of, of pain and suffering and what it actually looks like specifically in our lives. And so let me give them to you quickly. He noted that suffering sometimes comes as a consequence of human sinfulness. Let me give you some examples. Sometimes suffering comes into our life and pain enters through the carelessness of others. Do you remember Mephibosheth, Saul's son, who was lame for life because someone who loved him and was trying to save him and protect him dropped him at five years of age. And for the rest of his life, he was lame. Second Samuel chapter 4 tells us the story. Or sometimes pain and suffering come into our life because of the sins of another person. Remember the story of Abigail in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 25 who lived with a husband whose name was Nabal. And his name represented his heart and his character. Someone whose heart was like stone toward God and who was harsh and who behaved badly toward others. Or sometimes intense pain and suffering come into our life because of our own sins. You can't begin to read Psalm 32 without recognizing that David is giving you the anatomy of his own confession, and, and, and there was a, an extended period of time when because of his own sin and his, his refusal to acknowledge that sin before God, that his inner heart was tortured with pain that came because of this. And so suffering comes at times from human sinfulness. Lambert says suffering also comes from living in a cursed world, and you have things like a man being born blind in John chapter 9, verse 2, or the loss of a child through a disease like Tabitha in Matthew chapter 9, or physical infirmity and disability like the woman with an issue of blood in Matthew chapter 9, or simply suffering because you love Jesus in a hostile world. In John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And so sometimes suffering comes because we live in a cursed world. Sometimes suffering comes from Satan. Peter in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 reminds us that he is a roaring, raging lion who is aggressively, intentionally seeking to devour and destroy God's image bearers. Ferocious hatred, paralyzing fear, crushing guilt all come because of the attack of this evil one. Lambert had a fourth category, <clears throat> suffering that comes from the pain of others. And we've already sort of talked about pain at the hands of others. Many of you in this room know the betrayal of a spouse or the sin of a child or the betrayal of a close friend that you trusted or the loss of ministry by the hand of someone you loved and served or a congregation that you loved. You know that pain. You, you've lived that pain. And that pain has come at the hands of others. But sometimes it's pain on the account of others. 
It's pain you feel as you watch other people make choices. For example, in Romans chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, there's a, a very unusual statement by the Apostle Paul where he, he transparently tells you how he feels, and he talks about having great sorrow and unceasing pain because he is watching his own kinsmen reject the hope of Israel. Sometimes suffering comes from profound confusion because we are not God. We are not omniscient. We, we don't know all things, and we don't even know that what we know is fully accurate. I mean, sometimes we, we know, and, and, and sometimes we, we know that we don't know, but oftentimes we, we don't know that we don't know, and we don't know what we don't know. I'll never forget the illustration many years ago that reminded me of this, uh, and, and it resonated me because I, I do quite a bit of travel in the ministry that God has afforded me, and I'm, I'm so thankful for those uh, times of ministry. But, but imagine I'm on a, a plane uh, or getting ready to board a plane, and, and I have a few moments before the flight, and, and I go and I, I buy a newspaper, and, and there are two things that I am so thankful for that are in a broken world that sort of make a broken world bearable. One is Coke Zero. And I, I just, I think it's one of the greatest gifts. I'm actually hopeful that it'll be in the new uh, kingdom. And the other is peanut butter crackers. You know what I'm talking about? Those orange peanut butter crackers, they come in a pack and I think there's generally you can get, you can get, you know, six in a pack and if sometimes you get the big pack that has four rows, so there's eight of them in a pack. And so imagine that I have that, and I have my, my Coke Zero and my newspaper, and I'm sitting down, and there's a, a lady next to me, and I put my stuff down, and, and uh, I start reading the paper. And I hear a sort of crinkly noise, and I, I kind of look over the edge of the paper, and here is this woman opening up my pack of crackers. And she takes one out and proceeds to eat it. And then I reach over and just grab the pack of crackers out of her hand and take one and eat it. I'm not going to let her eat all my crackers. And I put the pack of crackers down and I keep reading my paper. And the next thing I know, I see this little hand coming and grabbing the crackers. And, and she takes another one out. And now there are five crackers left. I'm counting. So I look at her, and I take the cracker pack back, and I eat two. And then she reaches over and takes another cracker, and I'm going to not let her have the last one, so I'll eat the cracker. And I just kind of look at her. I cannot believe this woman. What audacity. And so half an hour later, we get on the plane and put all my stuff up, and, and we get going, and about halfway through the flight, I'm, I'm hungry, so I think, you know, I'm going to see what I have in my bag, and I pull down my bag to get stuff out, and, and there on my bag is my unopened pack of crackers. What do you do with that? You pray for the new kingdom to come quickly. We are not omniscient. You only know from one perspective, and your opinion of that woman just changed completely, and so did your opinion of me. <laughs> we are not omniscient, and we are not omnipotent. We do not possess sufficient ability or capacity to change the things in our life that are crushing down upon us, and we are certainly not omnipresent. We can't go back to the beginning and do it over again, and we can't get to the end to find out all that is going on, all we can do is muddle our way through the middle. And all of this causes us great anxiety, overwhelming fear, crushing pressure, compounded by the fact that God is often silent and appears absent in the midst of all of this. And if that weren't enough, there is the suffering that comes in the face of the reality of death. Hebrews 2 14 and 15 describe it this way, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things 
that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death were subject to a lifetime of slavery. You and I face the fact that we are dying daily. There is a progressive dying that is happening to you and to me every single day. There is the daily decay, the ruin, and the humiliation of our earthly body. You and I finish or or, or face diminished capacity and diminished ability and diminished opportunity. And the fact is, the body you have and the body that I have, it's the only one I own. It's the only one I've ever known. And for most of us, the best and strongest days are behind us. I mean, when was the last time you went out and climbed a tree like you did when you were 10? And when you leave here, please don't go climb a tree, especially if you're over 50. I mean, the bottom line is, as I look at the body that I have and you look at the body that you have, it is diminishing in its capacity, its ability, and and its opportunity. And, And we have no real concept, at least I don't, of what a resurrected body looks like and feels like. So I live in fear of losing the body that I have. I don't want to become a disembodied person, so I want to keep it. I want to change it. I want to modify it. I want want a body that fits me and who I think I am. And at the end of the day, at the end of 70 short decades, or maybe eight, or by reason of extra strength, nine, this body that has been decaying and ruining and, and, and humiliating itself will be planted in the ground, in the earth, like like a dried out husk, a a, a dead seed. And the devil keeps us captive to that fear. So where do I go with all of this? What do I do do with the reality of pain, and and, and not just the reality, but the complexity of pain in my life? What, What does God actually say to me that sort of puts all of this in context, and, and really what, God, what God's Word does is it gives us reason to embrace God's purpose for pain and suffering. And, and, and let me take you to four texts that show this to us. James chapter 1 reminds us that suffering well is actually good for us when we suffer and we do it well. There is, there is purpose and there is benefit to it. Notice how James says it in chapter 1, in the very familiar portion of Scripture that you've memorized from the time you were young. My brother encountered all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing, being assured of, understanding, reckoning that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then patience has a perfecting work, a completing work, that you may be perfect, complete, entire, lacking nothing, wanting nothing. So suffering well, according to God, is actually good for us. And it's not just good for us, it's good for others. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, instruct us in this way, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation in order that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Let me stop here for a moment. In the course of the two days that we have been together, last night you heard a testimony from Tim Geiger. And just a few moments ago, you saw a testimony and heard a testimony of Rosaria Butterfield. And the hope and the comfort that they received from God is a great blessing to the body of Christ itself. And not just to the body of Christ, but to people who are themselves suffering with those same struggles. 
And it may be that you're not suffering in that same way. It may be that that's not the area of pain and struggle that you experience. It may be that that's not where your sinful nature exercises itself. And your regrets may not be tied to those same kinds of sinful choices. But as we saw yesterday in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, if you can't find yourself in verse 9, you can find yourself in verse 10. And every one of us has received from the gospel comfort and strength and energy from God that is intended to be used for the benefit and the good of others. So suffering well is good for us. It's good for others. And Philippians chapter 1 reminds us that suffering well is actually good for the gospel. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippians, said, I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Here's Paul writing to the Philippians and saying that the, the imprisonment that I'm experiencing has taken the gospel to unbelievable places. And it has fell, it has fallen upon the hearts of unbelievable people. Colossians 1.24, Paul reminds us there that the sufferings of Christ did not exhaust all the suffering that God intended for His people, that there is yet more suffering. And the suffering that brought the gospel to us will oftentimes be the kind of suffering that those who take the gospel to others will also endure. And that brings us to this thought, suffering well brings glory to God. Suffering well brings glory to God. And notice how Paul explained this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Notice how he describes this. Lest I should be exalted above measure. So this is why this happened to me. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. I I beseeched. This is not sort of a casual, Lord, can you take this away? This This is an ongoing conversation, deeply passionate, out of the Apostle Paul's heart. I besought the Lord about this thing three times, that it might depart from me. And in essence, God said to Paul, I'm not taking this away. I'm not taking this away. But here's what I am going to do. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, as I listened to Tim talk last night and to Rosaria talk a moment ago, and they continue to talk about their sin nature and its struggles, you know what you walk away with? There is an amazing power in the gospel that energizes us. So what am I to do with all of this? How do I cultivate a response to pain and suffering that will allow me to suffer well. And Peter has an answer to this in 1 Peter 4, verse 19. He says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Whatever pain is in your life and whatever its source or its origin, whether because of the sinful choices of another or your own, or maybe just the realities of living in a fallen world, there is an internal response that God desires of us. And that response is described in this way, that we would keep on trusting Him, that we would keep on bringing our soul to Him, the faithful one, the creator, in the midst of all of this pain and suffering, in the midst of the desert place, that every day, every hour, every moment, we would not abandon the gospel, and we would not depart from the God of the gospel, but that like Jacob of old, we would lay hold on the Lord 
and not let go, that we would keep on entrusting our soul to our faithful Creator. And, and that inner response manifests itself in an outward way, and the outward way is this, that we would keep on doing good in the midst of this season of suffering, that our trust in the invisible, silent God would lead us to keep living in obedience to the written and revealed will of that God, which ever speaks to us. And that is going to demand from us an ongoing reliance that we would depend on His grace and on His enablement, and that's exactly what we read in 1 Peter 5.10, but the God of all grace the God who is the source of grace. And grace here is not just unmerited favor. It is, it is the energizing that comes from God. And all of this cultivation of a response like this is grounded in one final thing, and that is that, that we look confidently toward God's resolution to pain and suffering. And that's exactly what we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, there, there is a promise in this text that Peter gives to us that is designed to sustain us in those times of prolonged suffering and deep pain when our faithful Creator seems distant and absent and silent. Peter says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You know, when you read that in the King James, it sounds like a prayer or an invocation. But I want to read it to you again out of the ESV, and I want you to notice that it's actually a promise to you. Here's what Peter said, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, and then here's the promise, will Himself this is not something he delegates to an angel. This is not something that is intermediary. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will do something. He will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. And he will establish you. And that promise of sustainment in this life is coupled to a promise that God makes for the life to come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We do not grow faint. We do not grow weary. We do not lose heart in the midst of all of our pain and suffering. Even though our outer man is perishing, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And then he makes this amazing statement, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. I don't know that I would personally describe the pain and suffering in my own life as light affliction. I don't know that you would describe your own pain and suffering. You don't know mine. I don't know yours. But through the providence of God, we do know Paul's because it's written down for us. We have a window into the soul of this man. We have a window into the ministry of this man. We have a window into the, the, the pain that came, the crushing weight of the church as it rested on his shoulders. We, we hear comments that he made under inspiration that that nobody stood with me at my defense. All abandoned me. Think of how much Paul invested in the lives of people. Demas has forsaken me. Think about the profound physical trauma that Paul experienced in his life. Think about the crushing weight that would come upon him as he recognized who he was actually persecuting when he was wreaking havoc on the church of God, and dragging people even unto death. I don't think Paul was exaggerating 
one moment in his own mind when he said, I am the chief of sinners. The physical affliction, the spiritual trauma. He talked about despairing even of life, the anxiety, the weight of all of it. You don't know mine and I don't know yours, but in the providence of God, we know Paul's. And when Paul looks at all of this, he says, I want you to know how I would describe all of that. It is a momentary light affliction compared to an eternal weight of glory. I don't know what you're suffering with. Maybe it's pain that has come into the life of your own soul because of somebody else's sinful choices, circumstances of life you never anticipated. You didn't anticipate your body would do this. You didn't anticipate the economy would do this. You had no ability to predict where you are today. You had no idea what your children would do, what your spouse would do. You had no idea. Or maybe the pain you're feeling today is because of your own choices and you live in this, in this cycle of m- memories of if I could just go back and do it over. But Paul's answer to you is this, all of that is momentary. What is crushing you by the grace of God is light. And one day when you stand not too far, and not too long from now, in the presence of God, there will be an overwhelming, crushing weight of glory that will come because of all of this. So as we close our conference, the God who never lies has told us the truth about pain and suffering. And that God, through his son, Jesus, is our merciful high priest, and he fully experienced all of that pain and suffering for us. The God who is always at work for our good and his glory never wastes that suffering. The God who is ever faithful and ever strong will sustain us in our suffering, and the God who is abundantly gracious and good will one day resolve and remove our suffering and reward us for it. So I go back to Jeremiah, or actually Isaiah rather, who reminded us that there would be a day when the one, the anointed one, would give to us beauty for ashes. He would give to us the oil of joy in place of our mourning, and he would give us a garment of praise to replace the spirit of heaviness. And because of his ministry, we would be trees of righteousness. We would be described as as ones planted by the Lord. And when all of this happens, he will be glorified, and his name is Jesus. And you know him and he knows you. Lord, thank you for our conference. Thank you for this wonderful text in Isaiah, coupled with what we've learned from Peter. And I pray, Lord, as we've talked through and and been helped so greatly by those you have sent our way, Lord, we recognize that they are your messengers, and the real help has come from your word and your spirit through them. And so as we leave this place, I pray that our own hearts that have to navigate our own personal pain, our own season of suffering that come in so many different ways, in in so many different eras of our life and for so many different reasons, that, Lord, we would come to that place where we would navigate our pain in ways that would be good for us and good for others and good for the gospel so that your name would be glorified as you give us beauty for ashes. In Jesus' name, amen.